You are listening to episode 18 of the Scuddy podcast. This episode is the second of a trilogy of episodes on the topic of rogue trading within the wholesale financial markets. Many of Scuddy's financial experts have witnessed and experienced the devastating effects of a trader gone rogue. In this trilogy, we hope to share the personal accounts of our experts and what it's like to deal with these unprecedented events. We hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the Rogue Trader Chronicles. In this second episode of the Rogue Trader Trilogy, we're going to be looking at the aftermath of the Nick Leeson case at Barings Bank, including what happened to Leeson after the event of the Barings collapse. We'll then introduce the two major rogue trading cases of this century, those being Jerome Curviel of Sokgen and Kweku Adaboli at UBS, which will pave the way to our final discussion in part three, where myself and the experts of Scardi will be looking at some of these cases and how they might look different in the world of finance today. In particular, with reference to the recent merger between Credit Suisse and UBS. Welcome to episode 18. Let's start with a quick recap of last episode. In part one of the Rogue Trader Chronicles, Nick and Martin shared their experiences of what it was like to work at Barings Bank the year it collapsed. That weekend, uh, I remember going back, uh, getting the weekend papers to have a look to see if there was any news around and nothing was there on the Saturday and got the papers on the Sunday and flipped straight to the business section uh, to try and find any details about this missed margin call. and. Uh, I remember uh, my wife was poking me in the side of my arm and flipping over the front page and saying, <laughs> look at this, Perrins is bust. And that was that was the first uh, r- real uh, inkling I had that, wow, something big had happened. I do remember when those directors came back to America Square, one of them, and I try, I, I'm not going to name them, but I remember them running onto the dealing floor going, it's all gone wrong, it's all gone. In. And it just created pandemonium it and did. panic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there were sort of mad scenes as people sort of tried to grab things and... I think and anything, computers, <laughs> staplers, <laughs> pencils, <laughs> rulers, I don't know what was going to fly out the door, but people yeah. just wanted to just grab anything they could and, and run out of the building. The cause of this collapse was down to the rogue trading activities of Nick Leeson. Now, Leeson started off in operations at Bearings before moving to a front office trading role on an arbitrage desk. Now, although arbitrage assumes a very low risk, Leeson started to take larger and larger positions that were essentially huge directional bets on the market. Along with this, he used his knowledge of the firm's operational systems, such as error accounts, to hide the huge losses he was taking from teams back in London and everywhere else. From the viewpoints of many people in the firm, it just looked like Leeson was having great success as an arbitrage trader. And of course, why question the work of someone who is seemingly making millions for the firm, especially with bonuses just around the corner? Now, there are many factors that came into play that allowed for Leeson to successfully run circles around his superiors back in London. One of the largest contributors to his success in hiding his loss-making trades was his operational knowledge of how bearings and its systems worked, as well as the management vacuum, which was exacerbated by the fact he was reporting to offices across different continents. Leeson classically was very good at playing off management between Asia and London and hoodwinking both sets of management. Uh, Bearings, if you read the Bank of England report, was a complete management failing, really. No one really knew what Leeson was up to. He was able to run rings around his his London superiors. Despite Leeson managing to successfully play off the various management teams, his eventual undoing was caused by the markets themselves. As we discussed earlier, Leeson moved from arbitrage training to effectively making huge speculative bets on the direction of the markets. He was using large amounts of Bearing Bank's own money to finance these trades, giving the firm a huge exposure to the Nikkei index. 
Leeson's undoing would be something that even the best market experts couldn't have predicted, but an event that would impact the financial markets on a global scale. On 17th of January, 1995, a natural disaster occurred that threw the markets into absolute turmoil. The Kobe earthquake killed more than 6,000 people, leaving over 45,000 people homeless. This was an unprecedented event that would shake the very core of the financial hub that Leeson was most invested in. The Nikkei index plummeted off the back of the earthquake, causing Leeson's positions to suffer huge losses. Now, rather than Leeson admitting to these losses, he then started doubling down on his bets in a desperate attempt to recoup his losses. He was making unauthorized trades which he managed to hide in an account that he had set up in the name of an imaginary client, once again putting his operational experience and knowledge of the bank's systems to good use. Eventually though, Leeson's losses became too large to even count. An investigation was launched when a Barings Bank executive noticed irregularities in the accounts. It was discovered that the losses were huge, large enough for the Bank of England to consider a rescue package for the Britain's oldest merchant bank. Unfortunately, however, the bailout fell through, as the scale of losses was deemed too unknowable for a comprehensive rescue package to be administered. The total losses surmounted to £827 million, which was more than twice the amount of Bearings' available trading capital. As a result, Bearings collapsed and was subsequently bought for IMG by the mighty sum of £1. Amongst the chaos, Leeson had fled the country, leaving nothing but a simple note. It read, I'm sorry. After fleeing to Malaysia, then Thailand, and finally to Germany, he was found and arrested in Frankfurt and extradited back to Singapore in November of 95. Leeson was then sentenced to six and a half years in prison, charged with fraud on the grounds that he had willfully deceived his superiors about the riskiness of his trading, as well as hiding the scale of his losses. But would this be the last we heard from Nick Leeson? No, it would not. During his time in prison, Leeson wrote his book, Rogue Trader, which later be turned into a film in 1999, starring the likes of Ewan McGregor and Anna Friel. He's also managed to make various celebrity appearances on TV shows, shows like Big Brother. And in recent months, Leeson has even reappeared as a poacher turned gamekeeper acting as a private spy for a corporate intelligence firm to investigate financial misconduct and help investors to seek compensation in court where the regulators are unable to help. You're listening to the SCADI podcast. SCADI are the financial experts. Our deep understanding of complex financial products and front office expertise give us the ability to ask the right questions for you and solve the problems other subject matter experts cannot see at speed. Whether we've worked as traders or in operations, everyone you'll speak to at SCADI has frontline knowledge and a deep understanding of financial products. We share our practical financial knowledge, analysis, focus and clear thinking, and we communicate with clarity. We're proudly multilingual. We take great care to make our findings accessible so you feel confident, you understand what's happening when and why. SCADI, the financial experts. Welcome back to the Road Trader Chronicles. I'm your host, Coleman Corey, and without further ado, we're going to press on to, you guessed it, more rogue trading. Now, so far, we've covered the case of Nick Leeson at Barings Bank, who held the record for the most losses as a result of unrestricted trades. That was until, however, 2008, when Sokgen announced a new record holder, Jerome Curviel. 
he managed to lose a whopping seven billion dollars. Should let it be known at this point that we don't endorse any kind of achievement in the area of rogue trading. But nonetheless, that is an impressive feat from Jerome there. Interestingly though, despite managing to lose more than three times the amount that Leeson did, the bank Curviel was working for at the time, Société Générale, is still standing today. However, looking at today's times, Sokgen has a current market cap of just under $20 billion. So had Jerome's rogue trading shenanigans happened today, it would have been enough to potentially sink the bank. Now, there are some similarities between the cases of Curviel and Leeson, but one of the major differences between the two is that Curviel has claimed to be more of a victim of the financial markets and the general environment of the institution he was working in, rather than being an outright perpetrator himself. In fact, famously, Curviel even met the Pope at the Vatican in February of 2014, before undertaking a pilgrimage from Rome to Paris in a protest against the tyranny of the markets. He uh, started small. Um, he was, in fact, his first trade had been a profitable trade uh, way back in 2005. Uh, he had shorted Allianz, the German insurer, uh, during the, Lon the London bombing attacks and made uh, decent money on the trade, I think about 500,000 um, euros, for which he got a pat on the back, even though his desk were theoretically not supposed to be taking positions. Um, it, uh, it, I think that was a, a, an encouragement for him to carry on and, and carry on trading. As Scardi's director, Damien Taylor, mentioned there, Curviel started making trades around 2005 that went beyond the mandate of his desk. And he was applauded for it. After all, it's probably quite hard to condemn the actions of a trader in a bank when those actions are making nice amounts of profit. Curviel's lawyers even revealed that he had managed to make the bank a profit of $2 billion by the end of 2007. According to Curviel, the bank had been very happy with his performance and he was expecting to receive a hefty €300,000 bonus. Quite clearly, it seems that there was no incentive for Curviel to stop what he was already doing. However, we can't let Jerome completely off the hook. As with any case of rogue trading, there has to be some form of deception on the part of the trader in order for it to be classed as a rogue trading incident. Now, in the case of Curviel, he was a master deceiver. Coming from a middle office background, he had already got a good handle on how the bank's operations worked, and he was very cunning in the way that he managed to disguise his trading activities to make it look like the typical conduct you might expect to see in his department. One of the ways he managed to hide his activity was by intentionally creating fictitious losing trades. This would give the appearance of offsetting some of his early gains made from his unauthorized trading. Now, since he was working on an arbitrage desk, a high volume of low risk trades was deemed quite normal for his department. And many analysts have since thought that this was what would allow for the large scale of his unauthorized trades to go unnoticed. Officials from Sokgen have even claimed that Curviel was closing his trades in less than three days so as to avoid the trade's timed control trigger from the bank's internal control system. After doing so, Curviel would then shift these older positions to newer ones using a different instrument to avoid detection. Now, although Curviel has since admitting to doing things like exceeding his credit limits, He's claimed that these kinds of activities were actually practiced by a lot of other traders within the company. Supposedly, then, he was only doing what he thought to be normal. It was January in 2008 when the bank finally uncovered a series of unauthorized trades which they traced back to Curviel. By then, Curviel had accumulated unauthorized trade positions of over 49 billion euros. Over the next week, the bank started to unwind his positions 
which was also during the time when the markets were experiencing the negative effects of the global financial crisis. The resulting losses from this ended up being around 4.9 billion euros or $7 billion. Whilst Curviel argued that this panic selling was actually the reason for the massive loss incurred, it was a potentially life-saving move for Sokgen, given that the worst of the big GFC was not yet over. So, what was the outcome for old Jerome? Well, one thing is for sure, he certainly got a tough sentence. Initially, anyway. Curviel was sentenced to five years in prison with a permanent ban from ever working in the financial services. On top of this, he had to repay the entire seven billion that was lost, which somehow seemed a little bit of an unrealistic punishment. Interestingly though, unlike Leeson, he wasn't charged with fraud. The police stated that they didn't have enough evidence to charge him with fraud since his actions were known to his superiors. Instead, he was charged with a breach of trust and illegally accessing computers, which is ironic given that he now works in IT. Good news for Jerome, however, his $7 billion sanction was cancelled by one of the French courts after Sokchen was established as also being a wrongdoer in this situation. So, Curviel's rogue trading activity had managed to wind down by late January of 2008. No doubt, Curviel's staggering loss would have made the headlines for months to come after the incident, warding off any potential wrongdoers in the world of trading. At least, one would have thought. However, it was not only nine months before the seeds of another rogue trading scandal were planted in the London offices of UBS. I refer, of course, to our third and final major rogue trading case. Kweku Adaboli. Mr. Adaboli first arrived at the UBS offices as an operations intern, no less, before returning a year later as a graduate trainee in 2003. Now, like Leeson and Curviel, his banking career would start off in the back office or in operations of the bank. It took him only two years of working as a trading analyst before he was then promoted to a Delta One trading desk. Three years later, he was ready to head his very own ETF trading desk and get cracking with a bit of rogue trading bonanza. Uh, he worked on what was uh, called the Exchange Traded Fund or ETF desk, uh, which is also an arbitrage type desk, although this desk, unlike the other two, was allowed to have uh, positions on, it, on its books. It had small uh, trading limits, which uh, did allow the, the bank to take small positions based around client flow and client business uh, in the futures and ETFs market. What he was doing though as well, uh, he had uh, inside knowledge of how a lot of the systems worked. Uh, he was taking huge bets and not hedging them out on the other side. So he took, he took uh, bets to the, to the tune of, I think it was up to about $10 billion. Uh, and when it unraveled, he cost UBS just over $2 billion, which was enough to cost uh, the CEO at the time, his job, he spent time in prison and was in, in fact deported to Ghana in November of 2018. A beautiful summary there from Scardi's director, Damien Taylor, with a lot to unpack. Let's first take a look at Adaboli's supposed ETF desk and how it may have given rise to his unauthorized trading. Now, as Damien mentioned, Kweku's primary role was to put together exchange-traded funds for the bank's clientele, where his desk was allowed to take minimal positions that followed customer flow. But Adaboli started exceeding the per-employee daily trading limit without even bothering to de-risk his trades by hedging them out on the other side. In order to hide these risky trades he was taking, he even entered false information into the UBS computers and made clever use of an umbrella account that was used by his desk as a way of smoothing their daily profit and losses. Adaboli famously at UBS um, 
there was an umbrella account that allegedly a lot of the desk also knew about, which was a sort of rainy day account that they would use as a PL smoothing mechanism, which was completely against um, UBS policy. Uh, they would take uh, good PL days and use those to smooth off bad PL days. Uh, and this was uh, a big problem. And obviously, the fact that it was seen as, uh, as normal um, within the bank allowed. Uh, Adaboli to flourish and, and carry on with his rogue trading. Another way that Adaboli managed to disguise the risk of his trades was by using forward settling cash positions for his ETFs. What I mean by this is that the confirmations for his ETF transactions were not actually issued until after they had been settled. So for Adaboli, this meant that he could receive money for these trades before the transaction had even been confirmed. As far as the people looking in on him were concerned, his books would have reflected the sales of these trades even if they had been settled yet, meaning that Adaboli could then use this cash in further transactions. Now, this kind of practice isn't a major problem so long as the volume of fails to deliver trades is manageable. In fact, many banks have deliberately allowed certain levels of fail to deliver as a way of being able to deal with financial stress. However, Adaboli took this to the extreme, and fairly soon he became overwhelmed with the amount of unauthorised trades he was having to juggle around to hide them from management. He even had to miss his grandmother's funeral to be able to carry on hiding all these unauthorised trades. If Adaboli was rogue trading to the extent that he was having to do things like miss his grandmother's funeral, then it begs the question really, why wasn't anyone else pulling him up on his suspicious behaviour? Well, the answer is probably simpler than you think. So in, in all, of, all three cases, um, what's interesting is that each one of the rogue traders sought to uh, present that people within the organization knew what they were up to and that um, it was accepted and acceptable what they were doing. Um, and I think there were there were also you know missed opportunities so in in the case of Curviel when he did his first rogue trades if you like they may not necessarily have been rogue because they were kind of out in the open but he certainly you know he had limit breaches for example um, then because he made money management didn't come down hard on him and in fact were seen to almost be applauding his behavior and that can send really wrong signals to a trader and to staff um, and that's you know that can lead to to big problems further down the line yeah, I think it's very key that controls are in place that with strict, for instance, you know, limits. Uh, and if people are breaking limits but then end up making a lot of money, that, as you say, could, had, was seen, I think, in all three cases possibly, as being a green light for what they did. I mean, I think that's... Yeah, on, on the one hand, you've got the, obviously the whole incentive with bonuses, you know, people, traders are making money and everyone's going to get a bonus from the kind of profits that they're making, then they're not going to pull them up for that reason because they want them to uh, be successful. But then on the other hand, if you're uh, seeing, you, you've got the kind of, like the business in transition thing, maybe you're trying to fit into your new desk, maybe you're trying to get your head around how some of the systems work, you may not have necessarily the confidence to speak up about it or, or question some of the um, some of the methods or, or you know the ways that uh, other workers might be doing things no I think that's, that's fair I think um, there'd be you know complacency from within the management and, and then the the perception is that you don't want to be the one to rock the boat you know you may be spotting things that don't quite seem right to you but then you have to be pretty strong to sort of stand up to that tidal wave of of, if, of um, of jubilation coming at you with what a wonderful year we're going to have to be the one to say actually this this is just really not right there are corners being cut here this this is seriously wrong it, it, it's um it's it's it, 
it's a difficult thing. Well, I think he. I think in the case of Adeboli, as I recall, he was pretty nasty. You know, when people tried to come up and challenge mm. him, he was he was a bit of a bully. And you know, we've all seen traders like that. Um, yeah. Speaking about myself, but yeah. um, but we, you know, certainly, you know, we all know the kind of personalities, yeah. and they're, they're in that position because they are kind of tough and, and mm. nasty because. You know they do have to lay the law down sometimes, but they there are those that can abuse that and be abusive Definitely. to to staff that are trying to control them. And over time, you know these people may just give up, retrench, let things slip, and you know it really takes some strength to bring some of these characters into line as they should be. Despite being the tough and nasty trader that he was, eventually it all became too much for Adeboli to handle. He told UBS management and they in turn informed the Financial Services Authority and the police. And it was a good thing too, because supposedly Quaker was only a gamble or two away from destroying Switzerland's largest bank, according to the prosecutor in Adeboli's trial, Sasha Vass. UBS then went on to unwind his unauthorised trades, with the losses from these trades being reported at $2.3 billion. Although UBS described these losses as manageable, they were enough to make the CEO and co-heads of global equities at the time resign. As well as this, it costed the bank a further £29.7 million in regulator fines, for the system and control failings that allowed Kwaku to do his unauthorised trading. You've been listening to the SCADI podcast. This episode was part two of the Rogue Trading Chronicles, where we've been discussing the rogue trading activities of Jérôme Carvial and Kwaku Adoboli. Join us for part three, where we discuss the lessons learned from our three major rogue trading cases and consider the risks of businesses in transition with reference to the recent merger between Credit Suisse and UBS. On the discussion panel today was Nick Corey, Damian Taylor, Martin Anthony and David Bridges, with research and interviews carried out by Coleman Corey and me, Alexandra Maxi. If you want to listen to more episodes, just find us by searching the SCADI podcast on any streaming platform and feel free to connect to us at SCADI Limited on LinkedIn to read about our research and business relating to anti-financial crime and control functions. Thank you for listening.